after a long, headache-inducing, credit card maxing year, I just finished the build on my 125,000 mile Corvette ZR1. The car is so fast, it drives great, it's really only missing one thing. Trust me, I know, but I think we can all agree that project cars are never truly finished. Last time, our goal was simply to join the four digit horsepower club. We did that, 1047 horsepower, but now it just doesn't seem as cool. So this time we're gonna shoot for 1100. We're gonna spend the next day squeezing every bit of power we possibly can out of the ZR1. Now I have to imagine that some of you guys might be thinking that this is a bit irresponsible or God forbid unsafe. Not to worry. That's why we bought these guys right here. 17 inch beadlock wheels, courtesy of Forge Line and some big sticky Mickeys to go along with them. It might seem like kind of an excessive setup, but we had to do it in the name of safety. That's not what you're saying here. Well, I suppose the reason's up for interpretation, but one thing we can definitely all agree on, they're gonna look sick, which we all know is the reason why 99% of people buy beadlocks. Regardless of the reason these fine wheels came into my possession, one thing I have not done before is mount beadlocks, so I suppose it's about time we struggle through this together. Based on the extensive research I've done in the form of watching one single YouTube video, this should be pretty easy. This is actually my first time seeing a beadlock up close and personal like this, and it's pretty impressive how they work. I don't know what I assumed they were gonna be like, but it wasn't this. You see that edge of the wheel right there, it's heavily beveled. On the inside of this lip here, it has the same kind of markings. The idea is it's gonna clamp the tire to the wheel with so much force that when we launch it at the drag strip, it's not gonna spin on the wheel like it may if we had a traditional wheel on the car. Of course, the performance, Safety benefits are awesome, but an even bigger benefit, in my opinion, is that because there's no outer lip on this, we should be able to just push this tire down over the wheel and mount it at the track if need be. Alrighty then. Now we just have to get it situated around this inner part of the barrel there. As far as I'm aware, that's pretty well how it should be. This may be the first time, and it may be the only time you see this on the channel, but we're actually going to read the instructions here. These need to be torqued to 18 pounds after a certain sequence. We're not going to skimp out. We're not going to ug a dug it. We're going to do it the right way for once. First set of bead locks down, and I have to say I greatly prefer this to using a tire machine, but enough talk about the wheels themselves. Now comes the important part. Do they make the car look faster? Side by side, they definitely look tougher. If you guys hadn't picked up on this yet, they are the same wheel. There's just a 17 inch version with a beadlock thrown on it. One thing I thought I was gonna be giving up is a bunch of section width. This is a 305, that one's a 345. We're definitely gonna be losing something, but I don't think it's gonna be as horrendous as those numbers suggest. Once we deflate this one to, I don't know, 16 pounds, 18 pounds, whatever we're gonna be running, I think it's gonna look a lot more like the contact patch of that one. One other really key note here, even though we're going from a 19 inch wheel down to a 17, we actually pick up height because how tall the tire is. At this point, we obviously have no data on these tires, so I don't know what that extra height's gonna do to our track speed but one thing i do know this big soft sidewall is going to help us from blowing the tires off in first and second i'm really hoping this is enough to allow us to safely pull the front tires when we launch at the track because unfortunately we're out of going down on tire size with a car making this kind of power it makes all the sense in the world to go to a 15 inch tire but unfortunately we can't do that without giving up our carbon ceramics with these brakes being so big we couldn't even fit a 17 without sending our calipers out to get shaved down so i'm hoping that this is the perfect happy medium I had to take it for a quick spin around the parking lot to get that ride height settled, but after some quick consideration, they look f***ing awesome. Not only that, but I'm pretty positive we don't have any rubbing. We don't have any kind of caliper clearance issues. The car is deafeningly loud, so we could be missing something. I suppose we'll find out if we rub through a brake line, but we'll worry about that later. Is it actually rub? Oh! <laughs> I know. Oh, so we'll get into that here. Uh, you know what? We'll just talk about it right now. <laughs> I did decide to go out last night and do a little bit of a... Uh, on road safety checking, and it turns out that we're rubbing pretty good. We 
left a ton of rubber on this upper side skirt piece here. So we have a couple options. As of right now, the fender sits down below the tire slightly. So I do want to raise the car up. I think that's necessary. Unfortunately, it's not going to be the easiest thing. And I'll tell you guys why in a second. In addition to that, I think we're going to go ahead and cut this side skirt piece here just to take that out of play. I know it kills you that I'm about to raise this thing up a little bit. I thought you were going to say you're going to lower it more. How would that make sense in this scenario? Just because it looked good. Look, look at that. Look at that filming. It looks sick. Yeah. But it doesn't matter if we cut through the tire and wreck it. It won't look sick on the back of a trailer. But you gotta drive her slowly, you know. <sighs> Stance, guys. Now we have such a beautiful day out here. We'll take this opportunity to work on the car outside for once. Given that we've driven on it a little bit since we made that hit, it doesn't look that bad, but when it first happened, it was nasty. You can see right there a little better now that we have the wheel off exactly where it was rubbing. Not only that, but the car is so low and the tires are so tall that it was rubbing the fender liner itself. On the old tires, we could get away with this sick, nasty stance, but now that we have some real sticky, tall tires on there, it's pretty clear we have to raise it up. On a functional, normal ZR1, it will be no problem. It'll take us about two minutes. We just have to spin that bolt right there. It will raise the car up, done. Unfortunately, on my not so normal ZR1, those bolts are so blown out. The bottoms can't twist anymore. You'll see exactly what I mean once we get them out, but we have to do a lot of extra work. I mean, a lot. Based on what we're doing at this very moment, I probably don't need to tell you which leaf spring came off my car and which one I just grabbed out of inventory. Look at that. This is easily one of the most destroyed lowering bolt pads I've ever seen. Luckily, we had this one off a of stock Grand Sport. It's actually really nice. Unfortunately, the leaf springs themselves are different, so we do have to pull these bolts out and put it into the ZR1 spring. These do have a tendency to seize, so we're not quite out of the woods yet. I knew they were bad, I didn't know they were this bad. If I did, I'd have probably made it a point to replace them a lot sooner. I know it might look like this whole situation we got going on out here is pretty bad, but it really wasn't too awful. We had to do this at some point, and now the next time we have to adjust the height is as simple as putting the car in the air and spinning a bolt. Oh my God, come on, man. It's a race car, not an off-road car. Obviously, I'm sure we all saw that one coming from a mile away, but we did have horrible issues with this car squatting terribly last time we are at the track. I think that's going to be fixed at the very least. I'm hoping we're not going to rub anymore. And it doesn't look that bad for a race car. I suppose this is a form over function situation. So as long as we're not rubbing through the tire, as long as we're not having blowouts at the track and wrecking the car, I'm going to call it good. There is a chance this may settle down a little more anyway and kind of aid in the aesthetics department. But as far as right now, the height that we're at, plus what we cut off there, I think we're going to be golden. And now that we got that knocked out of the way, I guess that kind of does it for the whole safety aspect. Now we can get to the fun stuff, pull it inside and install some go fast parts. as is the case with any supercharged car. If you wanna make more power, assuming you already have your cooling system figured out and everything else is working properly, you're gonna stick a smaller pulley on the supercharger. And trust me, I know, if you're not a supercharger guy, you're probably thinking, why does putting a smaller pulley on it make more power? This is the old pulley on the car, 2.625 grip tech by Kong. This one, a 2.5. It's not that much smaller, but even to the naked eye, you can see there's a bit of a difference there. This supercharger pulley is mounted directly on the end of the blower. Every time this spins, the rotors inside the blower spin. Keep in mind the numbers I'm about to give you are by no means accurate, but it'll give you a basic understanding of how this works. Say every time this belt completes one rotation, it turns this pulley 10 times. This one here, because it's a little smaller, it'll turn into 11. The other method of increasing how fast we're turning this belt, therefore blower speed, therefore boost, is increase the size of the lower pulley. So remember this, for more boost on a supercharged car, bigger lower pulley, smaller upper pulley. When I first got into the supercharged stuff, I of course thought, let's stick as small of pulley as possible in there. Let's make a ton of boost. Let's make a ton of power. Well, unfortunately, that's not quite how it works. The two byproducts of increasing blower speed and downsizing that pulley, heat, belt slip, neither of which are conducive to a healthy engine or making power. So you tell me that just changing this is gonna increase 50 horsepower? No, it's more so this right here. This is what we're counting on doing it. And as I look at it, I realize it's not much of a difference, but I think it's gonna do the job. 
that's for a different reason. We do have a massive advantage using that 2650 blower because if we were using, say, a ported stock blower like I was on my last car, you have to go down to a 2.3 or 2.2 pulley, which is tiny. Belt slip on that is much more prevalent, and on a build like that, this piece will be even more key, but this is a new tensioner setup from Kong Performance that adds an extra idler and changes belt wrap. The LS9 is notorious for belt slip. Even with this massive 11 rib belt, it doesn't contact the pulley enough once you start downsizing. Let's say theoretically with this tensioner, the belt wraps from there to there. With this one here, we're gonna pick up an additional 55 degrees and put it to about there. Now, could we have ran this tensioner with this pulley? Yes, I don't think it would have been that big of an issue, but while we're in there, which is of course the famous last words, why not install this? If we can reduce belt slip by even a small amount, it's gonna let us make more power. This does all seem easy enough, but this is where we might run into a little bit of an issue here. There's no solid data about which belt we need to use, so I ordered two that might work. Of course, I only have one in my hand in the dinos tomorrow. One of them showed up at Mr. Amazon, Bezos let us down on the other one and shipped it to Wisconsin. So basically there's a 50-50 shot this works and if it doesn't, we're all boycotting Amazon. If that smaller pulley same as last time, this tensioner is gonna be a little different though. We can access two bolts now, but because of the different design on this one, this bolt here we're gonna have a little trouble with. Slowly release. Teamwork making the dream work, right? <laughs> Just like last time before we can toss this belt in there, which I'm not looking forward to, we have to do a little bit of modification. I believe these things are made for like tractor trailers, maybe actual tractors, I don't know, but they're 12 rib, we have to cut one off. All right, you know the drill, yank on this, do not let go, because if you let go, I will lose a finger. The only thing I ask is if I yell right here, and next video I'm walking around like this, please just <clears throat> smash that like button. It never fails. Every holiday season, we all have that one person we need to shop for that seemingly has everything. Now you could certainly buy them a 1500 horsepower twin turbo Audi R8 cart, which they probably don't have, or you could buy them a gift that's ultra unique, super high quality, and won't break the bank from the sponsor of today's video, Holzkern. Holzkern started as a small family business in Austria. They make insanely cool watches, bracelets, necklaces, even sunglasses and handbags out of wildly unique natural materials, which means every piece is different. You guys see the kind of cars we build here. You know I like to do things just a little bit differently, which is why I could not think of a better brand to partner with. My personal favorite's the Canopy. It's got a super solid wrist feel, it's unique and eye-catching even from a distance, and I mean, where else are you getting a watch that's made out of zebra wood and marble? And not only that, every watch comes with a certificate of authenticity and a 24-month guarantee. Add to that the fact that Holmes Kern is a one-stop shop for men's and women's gifts, meaning you can spend less time shopping at the mall and more time watching mediocre YouTube videos made by yours truly, it's really a win-win for everybody. Holes Current offers free express worldwide shipping and they guarantee every order placed up to the 21st of December. Do not sleep on it. If you're ready to knock out your holiday shopping, replace that boring watch, or do both at the same time, head over to holescurrent.com slash scraplifegarage and use code scraplife15 for 15% off your order. And then come back and watch the rest of this video. That part's pretty important. Is that all you got? Yeah. We might have a problem here, guys. No bueno. Let me go get him, let go. Unfortunately, it's not even close to fitting. We're like an inch off on the water pump. Our only option was to find that original belt somewhere that I can get it today. All the local truck stores here in Maryland, nobody had anything. AutoZone, Napa, all the usual suspects, nada. But our good friend Eric back there in the shipping department happened to look on a old truck site called Triple R Truck Parts. It said they had one in stock and it said they're in Pennsylvania. We're in Maryland, Pennsylvania, not too far away. Turns out it's only about two hours. And while I can't make it up there today, my boy Gregory from Lyft here has the belt in his possession and is on his way here right now. $120 lift ride for a $100 belt, not ideal, but all we can do now is pray that it's the right one or else we're boycotting Lyft. Lyft saves the day today, hopefully. I gotta admit, I do love the fact that this package has obviously been sitting on the shelves for years. The package is yellowing, but hey, I guess it's our lucky day. Wow, you can see on the cut pieces, that's all we're gaining. It's really, really not much. You guys already know the drill. If this one doesn't work, we're screwed. We're not making the dyno tomorrow. 
God, oh, it's so close. It's really not that close. That was the problem. Um, okay. It's way further away than you think it is. I know. I know. I just need belt. a smaller idler. That's all. Oh, okay. There's, so no, there's no proper belt that's going to fit this with stock idlers, I don't think. I'm stressing where I can get a 76 millimeter idler because realistically it's our only chance. We were talking about where we could find one, what other cars they came on. If I could find one locally, the answer was no. Then Austin goes, hold on, don't we have another ZR1 in the other unit? I mean, it's rusty. The whole car has been on fire, but I think it's intact. Um. That'll clean up, right? There's our difference. This is what we have. I think that's all we're gonna need. Plus, this one's like a pound lighter. This thing's heavy. Let it go. What? Look at that. Well, it got on and it seemed easy, but it really wasn't that easy. It's like three hours after I wanted to get this thing done. But now that we have it wrapped up, there's only one more thing we have to talk about, and that's intakes. This is the intake we were running on the car. Five inch Kong Performance carbon fiber. It's an awesome intake, it makes a ton of power, but we're gonna try something a little different. This guy here is also a five inch intake, but you see up here at the front, it has a wider mouth. The hole in the filter is massive. It pretty much is no hole. It's just the entire face of the filter. Recently, there's some ZR1 guys that have made a ton of power on this thing. Granted, a lot of them have bigger motors than mine. 427's running a ton of boost, but I figure why not give it a shot? Yeah, back for round two, and I've already decided if we don't make enough power, we're gonna take the nitro setup out of this car and stick it right in the ZR1. We're gonna go ahead and ignore that. I don't think I'm a visitor if my car is already on the dyno. Fran, how you feeling this morning? You got some more power in you? Another 52 to be exact? Uh, it depends how much boost it makes. If it picks up two pounds, which I think it probably will on the pulley swap that we did, plus the air intake, blah, 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 I think it'll make 1100. I'm optimistic. I think it will. It just can't be 1099. Yeah. If that's the case, we gotta do some magic on the dyno. Whatever you need to do to get it over 1100, we gotta do it. I, I, I think we're, we're in good shape. This go around, as you might expect, is gonna be a lot easier, a lot simpler, because we're just making some small changes. No starting from scratch. The car already runs pretty much perfectly. Hopefully we just fire it up, make a couple pulls, make some power. <laughs> So what do we have going on here? We picked up two pounds of boost, not one. It'll make it. We need four and a half more horsepower. I mean, letting it cool on these things generally picks up a significant amount, especially because we just made, what, five or six dyno pulls in a matter yeah. of like 15 minutes. Ah, uh, she feels kind of cool. I think we're about to hit it. And just theoretically, Fran, if we were to add like five degrees of timing, just skip right over the 1100s and go right to 12, uh, yeah, 12 horsepower is probably what it would make because it would kick the rods out of it. I'm leaving motor in the ceiling? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, three horsepower away. That's not going to cut it. It is a pretty hot day out and here. We only have a couple fans blowing on it to try to cool it down. So I don't consider this cheating necessarily. Could not be happier with that. One of my favorite things about the ZR1, look at that graph. 
all the way up. No peak, it pulls to whatever the red line is, 7,200, 7,400. What did the temps end up being there after the ice? Uh, at the end of the pull, 98. And at the end of the last one, they were 136 or something wow. like that. So. There you go. That's the good part about supercharged cars. All you need to make more power is seven bucks in ice. Well, team, this went about as well as you could have ever expected. We came out, it made really trouble-free horsepower. We beat our goal by 21 entire horsepowers, and it's going home in one piece pretty much. I did just find out that there's something wrong with the driver window motor, so we're gonna have to diagnose that at some point. We can no longer roll the window up. Now that we can press pause on the endless pursuit for more horsepower, the question is, what do we do with it? And I think I have the perfect idea. We made it out of the parking lot, we got teched in. They gave us the whole, how fast do you think you're gonna run tonight? Do you have all the required safety equipment? Where's your parachute? Of course, my response was, I'm just happy to be here. It's the first time out for the car. We're just gonna launch it. We're gonna take it easy. I hope nothing breaks. <laughs> give it to you you didn't miss it so that's a huge progress is it though I it's mean e it's easy to shift this car the hard parts launching it as you guys just saw I blew the tires off Right there, from there, is Lee walking back. It doesn't look good. I don't back think... in a Mustang, I know. I'm never Jesus gonna hear the end of it. Christ. Yeah, I appreciate it. Be a race car, they say. It's gonna be fun, they say. Don't build a race car. Is it bad? I don't think it's bad, and that's the good news. We kind of leaked a bunch of coolant all over the track. What happened, if you see here, we're missing a belt. <laughs> the supercharger belt, that one that we, you know, Uber lifted, whatever it was. Now, it was pretty clear the car was down on power, but it ran fine, idle fine, all the way up the track. What I didn't know, though, is I smacked the coolant line. It threw this thing off. It lightly watered down the track. I kind of feel like a for not pulling over, but I truly didn't know until I got up at the top, tried to turn, and realized I didn't have power steering. Of all the failures to have, this is probably a pretty good one. It's nothing serious. The only issue we have now is going back to the shop and finding out how much stuff that dry belt took off when it threw. If it's just this coolant line we have to replace, I'm going to take it as a win. There is, however, of course, the chance that it smacks something worse, and there's more damage that I can't see right now. One thing I know for sure, I'm lucky it didn't hit that. It hit a coolant line, not the fuel line. We all know what would happen if it had taken that out. It sounds like we have a little more work to do. A lot of more work to do. Well, for as bad as last night ended, and it was bad. Two passes at the drag strip, having to tow it home, not in running condition, never what you want when you take the car to the track. But after looking at it, it doesn't look like we took out anything major. If you pull this straight up hard enough, it'll pop off without pushing in that plastic tab, and that's exactly what that belt did when it flew off and went bam. That poor hose didn't get it just one way. Over on the driver's side, where that belt wraps around the power steering pulley, you can see clear as day that silver mark right there where it hit it on this side as well. 
Don't ask me how, but somehow, some way, it didn't break this frail plastic line, but we are gonna replace it just out of an abundance of caution. I'd hate to get this thing back in working order and then lose a coolant line because we were cheaping out over 120 bucks. I've already pulled the tensioner off. That's on its way back to Kong Performance. They're gonna inspect it, repair it if needed. I do have a new belt on the way, this time via FedEx and not via Rideshare. I'll order up a new coolant hose next and we should have this thing back on the road, no worse for the wear, for a couple hundred bucks. Yeah, something about leaving you guys hanging on this one just didn't feel right. We got it fixed back up. It took all of three seconds to get her back on the road once we had all the right parts in. And now there's only one question left. What's next? As you can probably tell by the trees behind me, it's barely even fall anymore. It's going into winter at this point. I got so caught up with the other projects that it took quite some time before I had a few hours to put into this thing. What do we do? It's certainly too cold in the winter to drive this up here. It won't hook at all. Maybe we take it down to Florida for a couple of events. There's some awesome stuff going on down there in the off season. Or do I let the temptation of another build make me sell it? It's something that I've genuinely always struggle with. For me, the build's 90% of the fun. And unless the car has some special meaning like the 997 or the Demon, I'd hesitate to call any car a true lifer. So let me know what you guys think because at this point I'm genuinely torn. Do you want to see more ZR1 content or is it time to pack it up and build something else? Either way, thank you guys so much for the support you showed on this build. It started way back in the channel's infancy and I know for a fact there's a lot of day one people watching right now. Truly, thank you. We won't be anywhere close to where we are right now if it wasn't for every single one of you. Until next time, guys. If I ever break one of these, the track will be in rough shape. <laughs> Dude, did these get thrown in oh. Are you f***ing kidding me? Please tell me you got that on camera at least. <laughs> yes. Wow. At least you're cleaning the car that was already clean, yeah. shiny, and So perfect. much for that detail you did the other day. Jesus Christ. If you feel something wrong on your car, it probably is. You should probably stop. Pull over safely to the side of the lane, and we will come out there and get you.